Thanks, everyone. Thanks to Pat for the introduction and ensuring a standing ovation at the start of the speech. That was pretty, that was pretty good, Pat. Um, I am uh, very appreciative to Pat Mangle, uh, not just for our friendship, but because he is the maestro. He's the artist, together with those gentlemen you met uh, from the car club here and those who donated the supplies to build that beautiful rider, Shelby. A shout out to the Semples who made that fundraiser uh, go far beyond the actual price of the car and raise over a million dollars for Alzheimer's and football and Gavin and Sean and uh, Gaylene, we appreciate the very much the fact that they made that happen. People like Pat Mangle are the reason why we're celebrating uh, so much progress and opportunity in the province. Small business people, small business people who are doing big things, who are employing people and creating opportunities for families uh, and that's the kind of guy Pat is, and, and then he's, in his spare time, he just pours himself out for family and for community, and uh, Pat, it's a great honor to be introduced uh, by you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have just a few other welcomes and thank yous to give before uh, we begin the, uh, the speech tonight. I want to acknowledge Blake Birkeland and, and uh, the most senior vulture, because when they travel, it's Blake Birkeland and the vultures, and we had Bruce on that red telecaster. He's probably the senior... Uh, Vulture, uh, he might, we might, I might be in trouble now with the bass player, but the bass player's in Medicine Hat, so I don't really care. Um, <clears throat> you know what's lacking sometimes in, in country, in, in, in all genres really, what's lacking, I think, as a fan, is really good writing. In Saskatchewan today, we have amazing writing happening in every genre. And Blake Berkland, he's got his stuff down there by the stage. You'd do well to, to buy it, because he is a fantastic writer of lyrics and music, and he's a storyteller. Uh, this is what we have in the province now today, and, and Blake, thanks for being here tonight, and uh, everyone, I, I hope you'll help me thank him for playing this well for us for the dinner. I want to thank uh, the MLAs that are here. They've already been introduced, but I, I do this every year for good reason. I am. I am the benefactor of an amazing team of women and men that I get to work with, and you also met candidates. I'd like to be able to work with all of those as well. We, all of us as elected members, I think we'd like to do that. And, but to my colleagues in the legislature, I thank you very much for your support. To your family members that are here, thank you for supporting them and lending them to public service and to our capital city, to the legislature, and to our party's efforts in government. Uh, would you help me also thank our caucus, the Saskatchewan Party MLAs. Blair, you and your team killed it this year. Thanks very much. We, this is the biggest year we've ever had in terms of fundraising. You guys sold all these tickets. Obviously, thank you folks for, for buying the tickets uh, and for being here tonight. But Blair and the, and the ticket team, thank you. Uh, sponsorships were higher than ever this year. Thank you for those who have sponsored this particular event to make it the success uh, that it is as well. My wife, Tammy, is here. She's the most beautiful woman on earth, uh, woman on earth and uh, you should meet her. Tammy, you should say hi to everybody in the... Paul, please. She hates when I when I do that. Tammy. She uh, she's pretty amazing. She has obviously given uh, much and made all of this possible in our house and our family. And she's an engineer working uh, in her profession back in at the city of Swift Current and had a business and did all of that. And in the meantime, she was uh, giving mightily uh, uh, so that our family could do the things we've done. And Tammy, I, I just thank you very much for that. Also, we're here. <clears throat> my dad's here tonight. My mom's just recovering from back surgery. It's her second surgery in just a few years, so she couldn't quite make it. She wanted to be here. But my dad, John Wall, is here. And actually, he's with his brother, Frank Wall. Um, I didn't know that Uncle Frank would be here until I just saw him a moment ago. But these two were in business together for over 40 years. Uh, it's really an amazing story. but. I just want to say to Dad in this august company, in this big room, how grateful I am for your example uh, in every way. And ladies and gentlemen, John Wall and Frank Wall are here as well. <laughs> Blair's already know, uh, pointed out that we have a number of guests from Alberta, more than we've had in the past. There's a few more that are here. 
Uh, and so I want to thank you all for coming and make sure that you feel welcome. By the way, we have people from Toronto and Mani people from Manitoba as well. People from across the country have joined us. We want to make all of our out-of-town guests feel particularly welcome. But to our friends in Alberta, I, I just want to note uh, for the record that I've contacted your, the new Premier. We did that early on after she won and offered our help as a province. We know that what's good for Alberta is good for Canada and what's good for Alberta is good for Saskatchewan. So we're going we're gonna to want to work cooperatively with the new government uh, in Alberta and uh, we've certainly made that offer. I will note though that the new Minister of Energy said yesterday, and this is a quote, he said, I think in six months we'll have a pretty good map of where we're going. And that's very fair because they're taking over after a long period of time and they're a brand new government and it's going to take, I understand that it'll take six months or so for them to come up with a new map of where they're going. Uh, but to our friends in Alberta that are here tonight, I just want to say we, we already have a map uh, and we have some directions. And so, <laughs> it's easy to... Uh, pretty easy to follow that map. You don't need GPS really for, for that one. We are going to work together though with our colleagues and friends in Alberta on issues of importance in Western Canada. It has been, ladies and gentlemen, an eventful spring, not only because of the budget we had to bring down in the face of some very difficult circumstances, and I'll more on that in a moment, but because of the, the fact that the spring brings the legislative session, and the legislative session has its own strangeness. Here's a particular example. During the legislative session, I had to leave for Quebec City for a conference of Canada's premiers on the issue of uh, energy and the environment, and I wanted to be at that one. And so I remember very clearly that I was traveling between the airport in Quebec City and the hotel when my phone buzzed, and I looked down and I, had, I was receiving an email from one of the senior advisors to the government. Actually, it was from, uh, it was from Reg Downs. Reg is here. Uh, and the subject line of the email said, only quick. That's all it said. Quick. So I opened that particular email, wondering what it would say. Uh, and inside the email, uh, it said, <laughs> it asked me a question. It said, have you ever been to Mexico? And I, I was wondering what is going on back in Regina that I would get this email marked quick. Uh, and the email itself said, have you ever been to Mexico? Apparently what was happening back in Regina is they were in the middle of question period and our friends across the way were uh, asking some questions and making some assertions uh, about things that I might have done. In fact, I think they were accusing me of uh, accepting gifts from a business. That, a Regina business actually, accepting gifts from a business here and the gift was that I had stayed in, a, in the company's condo uh, in, in Mexico. So, nothing more specific than that, just somewhere in Mexico. So, uh, I mean, I responded to the email back to the senior, back to Reg and I said, well, yes, I have been to Mexico when I was six. <laughs> you know the family trip that a lot of you took, you do Disneyland and you do Knott's Berry Farm and Universal Studios and and then if you were unlucky, you did the Wax Museum. That was always a little creepy for me. Then you did SeaWorld, and you went down to Tijuana. And we had been there, and so I told them that. So we thought we'd tweet that out. We tagged the NDP in the tweet, said, yep, guilty as charged, have been to Mexico in 19... tickety I don't know, 72, whatever it was, and <laughs> bought, us some rare, bought some stuff, and we were there in, in Tijuana. Anyway, it worked pretty well. There was a lot of... Uh, uh, retweets on the tweet and our friends across the way had to apologize because obviously they, they were not right. In fact, the company didn't have a condo in Mexico. In fact, by the way, and I hope they don't mind this, the company that they were talking about is a great Regina company, a great Saskatchewan company called Devro, who have contributed mightily to the Saskatchewan advantage and if they're here tonight, we should thank them for that, especially for what they had to put up with in the legislature. Anyway, so I was thinking, well, this tweet went over pretty well. Let's kind of keep it going. And I asked mom and dad if they ha actually had a picture of us when we were in Mexico when I was very young. And maybe we could put that picture on Facebook or on we could tweet that picture out. That might be kind of fun. And mom found a picture of that particular trip and she sent it to me and I decided not to use it. <laughs> so... Uh, so uh, that's me and my brother, 
and um, I'm the shorter preoccupied <laughs> one. Why, Dad, 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 why would Mom want to take that picture? I, I clearly had other things that were on my mind. It's all, it's all true, though. It's a, Ladies and gentlemen, full disclosure, tonight's speech is going to get a little bit more partisan than usual. If you've been to these leaders' dinners before, we, we kind of we, we keep them a little bit less partisan than perhaps what you might find at the legislature. But, but in just a, a matter of months, the people of the province of Saskatchewan are going to make a choice, like they did in Alberta not too long ago. Uh, and we are going to want to present the case. And, and so I'm I'm going to perhaps get a little bit more partisan than usual because this evening I want to shape the, uh, the pending choice that's coming and I, I'd like to provide from our view certainly the context for the campaign to come. And we should start with the budget, this year's budget. A little over two months ago, the, uh, the Honorable Ken Crevettes, the province's finance minister, rose in his place to present his fifth balanced budget, the eighth consecutive balanced budget for the Saskatchewan party since 2007. Um, we've actually made a few changes, as you know, recently because Ken's decided he's not running again and he's stepping away, and, uh, and we've made a change. And Ken has also told me that under no circumstances am I to sort of pay him tribute tonight. I have been doing that, talking about what a great contribution Ken's made to the government, to the province over the years, but um, Ken Kravets is not the boss of me, and so I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Ken Kravetz is one of the most honorable men you would ever want to meet for those of you who know him. He's a man of great integrity. He's a man of great character. He's a man of diligence. He knows his files like no other. He is the only deputy leader this party has ever had for a while, serving as its leader in the House or the interim leader. He's the only deputy premier that we've ever had. He is a He's just a great man, and he has been a great servant to the province of Saskatchewan at the school board level, and then in the legislature, and then in the government, and then representing us in Ottawa and New York and all over the world. And Ken Kravetz, we just thank you very, very much for that, sir. And he's a Leaf fan, so he's got a bit more hope these days with the new hiring of Coach Babcock, hope springs eternal. It was a difficult budget for him and for the Treasury Board and for all of us as a caucus that were trying to ensure that it was balanced because oil prices had dropped 50%. And the hold in our budget from a revenue standpoint was between six and seven hundred million dollars. That's what we were short. And so it was a challenge to balance the budget. But we worked hard to control spending. Spending in the budget is up overall only 1.2%. In fact, 10 ministries and agencies saw a cut, a real cut uh, in spending. Wages were frozen for out-of-scope employees and senior government officials, uh, and that includes MLAs. We worked hard to control spending. We wanted to stay out of your pockets. What's happening with oil is a temporal thing. It's a short-term thing. I mean, whether it gets back to 100 or not, but it'll move off of 50 and 60 and up towards 70. And we did not want to take long-term action, especially potentially damaging action in the form of tax increases to deal with what might be a more temporal challenge that we have. And so we worked hard to stay away from a tax increase. And that's why there's not one in the budget. We made a change with respect to the degree of acceleration of depreciation on the potash side that provided some revenue. That's the choice we made. And here, by the way, is what Moody said about your budget in the province, about our budget. They are, of course, a New York credit rating uh, agency that has given Saskatchewan its first ever AAA credit rating. There are only three provinces in the Dominion of Canada that have that rating. You know, I, I, that's not quite true because short, uh, just, just before they gave us a AAA, Standard & Poor's, uh, another credit rating agency gave the, pro gave the province a AAA a credit uh, rating. But here's what Moody's had to say about the budget, about Ken's budget, our budget. The balanced budget underscores the province's fiscal discipline and diversity of non-renewable resource revenue in, current, in the current low oil price environment. Saskatchewan and British Columbia stand out from the other Canadian provinces 
that will likely post deficits in 1516. And then just last week, another credit rating agency known as Fitch Ratings said Saskatchewan's long-term outlook is, quote, uh, sorry, they, they pointed out that it's stable because of our sound fiscal management. Now you might think, I mean, it's stable is not that exciting a descriptor, really. Maybe hardly the stuff for, for a leader's dinner speech. Except that think where we were in December, facing a 50% drop in the price of oil, the dislocation that would happen in the energy sector because of it. I think then and now we would take stable, because stable today means growth still. One and a half, two percent growth and increasing in the out years. Fitch also noted that the province's economy will be boosted, ladies and gentlemen, by our capital spending program, and I think this was an underreported feature in our budget. This budget included record infrastructure investment in the province, about three billion dollars when you include the crowns. Yes, we made a decision to not increase taxes, but we also made a decision to keep building. We know the economy is strong today, comparatively strong. We know that when oil comes back in price, it's going to get even stronger. And the infrastructure deficit that was inherited years ago needs to be dealt with, not just when oil prices recover, but today to be prepared for that even stronger growth. And so there was a significant increase investment in infrastructure in Saskatchewan. Here's another part of the budget that didn't get a lot of coverage, but it's very important for this group tonight, I think. Within the budget, there was some innovation on the tax side to attract capital and new jobs. We introduced two new growth uh, tax incentives. One was for companies that would add corporate or head office jobs, corporate or head office jobs in the province of Saskatchewan, about $3,000 per job off the corporate income tax, and the other was for value-added processing and manufacturing for exporting companies at $10,000 per job. And in the days that followed, companies were responding, the days that followed the budget. In fact, Evraz, and I think they're here tonight, responded with the announcement of a $200 million expansion here in Regina that will create 1,000 construction jobs when it's fully uh, involved and 40 full-time production jobs when the expansion is over. Evraz has locations all over North America, ladies and gentlemen. They have locations in Alberta. They made a choice, and they tell us in part because of these tax innovations to make this investment and create these new jobs in Saskatchewan. We're fortunate that they're here as a good corporate citizen. We're doubly blessed because they're investing more dollars in the province and creating jobs. And then just a few weeks after that, up in Carrot River, I was at the announcement of Edwidge, uh, Edgeworth Products, sorry, in, Hud in, in Hudson Bay and Carrot River. That's where their operations were. They were announcing a significant expansion at their Carrot River Mill, $25 million to upgrade the sawmill, creating 50 new jobs. They've also announced that they have a tentative deal to sell that plywood plant in Hudson Bay, which should open as early as November, and that will create between 25 and 35 new jobs, again, responding to some innovation uh, in the budget of Ken Kravets and the government's budget that we just tabled. And prior to the budget, this is important for us to remember, especially given the context of falling oil prices. Prior to the budget, one of our great companies, now with our Canadian headquarters in Regina, Mosaic, announced a $1.7 billion expansion at K3 at Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan. They kind of knew what was coming in terms of change in potash, but they were making this long-term decision. This is a company, as the riders will know, and I know Jim Hobson is here tonight as well. We want to say it a hi, to, hi to Jim, but the riders will know what a great partner they are uh, in, uh, uh, with, with that club, but also in, in, in just so many various charities across the province. Mosaic, you should know, has 2,300 employees in the province of Saskatchewan. They have 135 working at the Canadian headquarters in Regina, facilitated by, the pro by a project we worked on with, uh, with Harvard Developments. Uh, and we just want to say to Mosaic for that investment, thank you very, very much. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see that there is attendant strength in this economy. You can see that you have been building a very resilient, 
diversified economy that has more than one cylinder in the engine. And this is important because our vision, your vision, I think, rests on the fact that a strong economy is what will pay for the quality of life we want for people in this province. It what, it's what will fund programs that help those most vulnerable among us. The arts, health care, education, all of that depends on the economic freedom someone might have to create a job and to add to the, a broadened, lower rate tax base in the province of Saskatchewan. Ladies and gentlemen, there was an interesting conversation in Saskatchewan, if I may put it that way, that served as a bit of a backdrop to this session, to the, to the budget itself. The conversation was sparked by television ads that were purchased, that were bought by our political opponents. The ads asked the rhetorical question, where has all the money gone? It's, it's not often that an attack ad from your opponents make you happy. But I was really, really happy to see those ads come on the air and to have this particular discussion. I was happy on behalf of, a, of our government and our party to be able to answer the question, where has all the money gone? For you see, the answer to that question is our record in government. We'll make no claim on perfection as a government, obviously. We've made mistakes. And we will, we're humans, we'll make further mistakes. But informed by what you asked for in election campaigns and between election campaigns, we've acted and we have a record that we're happy to defend today and happy to take to the electorate in just nine months. So where did all the money go then? How about $6.6 .6 billion on infrastructure in our first seven years? That doubles what the other guys were doing in their last seven years. That's where the money went. How about $5 billion in tax reductions? Where did the money go? It went back in your pocket and in the pockets of small businesses in the province of Saskatchewan. Historic property tax reductions small business reductions, income tax reductions, increases in the child tax credit, increases in the basic exemption, so that 114,000 low-income people in the province of Saskatchewan would f drop off the tax rolls completely, would pay no provincial income tax to our friends on the other side. That's where the money went. In 2007, we inherited some operating debt, not just from the previous government, mostly from governments before that, but they didn't take steps to reduce that operating debt, and so they handed it over to our government, and it was about $6.6 .6 billion worth. This isn't debt charged against an asset. This isn't Crown Corporation debt where they're going to finance their operations. This was debt to just finance the operations of government that was growing and growing and borrowed at pretty high rates, 9%. So think of it uh, as, a, as a credit card, really. That's what we got handed with $6.6 .6 billion on the balance. If it helps, think of it as a big orange uh, credit card, if, if that were to help. <laughs> to remember about the credit card and the debt. Ladies and gentlemen, we paid off 44% on, uh, of that credit card balance, $3 billion. It will not have to be paid by your kids or by my kids. That's where the money went. <laughs> New hospitals across the province, including places like Moose Jaw and Maple Creek and Humboldt, 14 long-term care facilities built in the province, $10 million for STARS, $285 million for the Surgical Wait Times Reduction Initiative, $4.3 billion in highways and record budgets there every single year, 400 more doctors, 2,600 more nurses of every designation in the province of Saskatchewan. That's where the money went. Two point 
2.7 billion we've invested overall, but massive increases for those most vulnerable among us who need the help of government, those with disabilities and intellectual disabilities. A thousand new child care spaces in Regina alone, that's a 43% increase in apples to apples times, time period at the time period over what the previous government was able to do. $700 million more in new schools in the province since 2007, and that doesn't count, as Ken Kravetz would remind us, of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the improvements, the maintenance dollars that have been put into schools, which were not there previously, frankly, and that'll take you to about a billion dollars. That's where the money went. $135 million invested in Regina area alone. That's a new Scott Collegiate under construction. That's Seven Stones Community School and the Arcola School. That's the new Douglas Park School completed. That's Emerald Ridge Elementary in White City. That's Sacred Heart and Connaught coming soon. And by the way, it will be three new joint use schools in Harbor Landing, in Skywood, in Greens, on Gardner. Construction expected to begin later this year. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where the money went. So that's the answer to the question. And we want to provide it today, and we, as I've said, we want to provide it in the months ahead and during the campaign. And we will also likely point out that if that is the rhetorical question people are asking today, and I don't know that it is, but if it is, it is markedly different from the rhetorical question that was being asked in this province for many, many years prior to 2007. And that question wasn't, where has all the money gone? That question was, where have all the kids gone? Where have all the young people gone in Saskatchewan? Do you remember, do you remember how that felt, ladies and gentlemen, when it was just a fact of life in Saskatchewan that young people would graduate from a trade or university or maybe from high school and they would leave as parents you'd buy them luggage because that was a pretty good graduation gift. Do you remember how that felt. You changed that, ladies and gentlemen. Because of what you have done, the population in this province grew by 17,000 people last year. Since 2007, and get this number, let us never get sort of complacent about this next number. Since 2007, the population of the province has grown by 122,000 people. Our young people are staying here because there is opportunity in Saskatchewan. You asked for government to provide some tax incentives for that to happen. We did. Responded with the graduate retention plan. We campaigned on it in 07. It's still available today. 58,000 graduates, post-secondary graduates, have taken advantage of the graduate retention program. And by the way, there were some adjustments in the budget to make it sustainable, but it's there still. In fact, now students have 10 years, or graduates have 10 years to earn that $20,000 back in tuition if they will stay here in the province. And those who moved away have been coming home. I received this email from a gentleman named Clay Mile, and I asked if I could read it to you today, and he said I could. He says, I and my two brothers grew up in Regina, son of a city cop, sons of a city cop. We all ended up moving to Alberta in the 90s as we each came of age. We found work there immediately and began to prosper, and years rolled by, and we began families there and purchased homes there. As we saw Saskatchewan beginning to turn around under the SAS party, and here they're wrong, because it, the turnaround didn't happen because of the party. It, happened because of what you demanded and the change you brought. But he says, we began to trickle back home to Saskatchewan, and here's the money shot. We all live and work and raise our young families in and around Regina, close to our parents and our extended family. We're proud of Saskatchewan and her people. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the change that you have wrought in the province of Saskatchewan. And my counsel tonight would be, if you're interested, don't let anyone change it back. Re Remember how it felt to live in a province where we just knew intuitively that we should be doing better. 
that we were underperforming, that our economy was better than what was on evidence, that we had all of these resources, that we had amazing people, but yet we were this economic laggard. We were underperforming economically. We had one of the worst job creation records in the country. You know what? You changed that too. You built this province into an economic leader. I hope, I hope that our growth plan helped you do that. Every day since 2007, this is how the math works out, every day since 2007, 25 new jobs have been created in Saskatchewan. That's about one an hour, a little bit more than one an hour. And at the, at the rate I'm going, we'll create a couple more by the time the speech is over. <laughs> Your Saskatchewan, the province you built, is now an economic record setter in exports and employment and in investment stats. Wholesale trade numbers came out a while ago and we were double the national average and leading the country in terms of growth. We've created 7,700 new jobs in the last jobs report, full-time jobs notwithstanding the pressure in the energy sector. You built this underperforming economy into a powerhouse. You changed that. Don't let anyone change it back. Remember how it felt to be called a have-not province, to depend on the kindness of strangers, to depend on equalization payments for our budget and maybe our social programs. Remember how it felt when you heard a finance minister of the previous administration, and I remember this because it happened, say, I don't know if we want to become a have province because we'll lose the equalization payments that come and help us with the budget. Today, you have built this province into a net contributor to the country that we love. And there is no prospect of us ever returning to have-not status. People have asked me, they said, well, the price of oil is off, or might we become a have-not province again? And I could tell you, uh, and I don't know, I, the formula is hard to understand, but this we know. The answer is no. Because you built this resilient, diversified economy that is about more than oil, it is strong enough today that I think any economist in our Ministry of Finance would say we're never going back. And I think people in this room would say, well, that's a good thing because I think we like the fact that in Saskatchewan we contribute more to the country than we ever have before in our history. Remember how... <laughs> Remember how it felt knowing intuitively also that we weren't getting our message out? You know, I, that we had all of these resources, but we didn't seem to have a focused plan to tell the world about the things that we had. Remember when, and this is true as well, a little bit partisan, but true. Remember when a former premier actually refused to join a trade mission to India because, and I'm quoting the Star Phoenix now, because, quote, he considered the entire Asian region to hold little positive impact on this province and its economy. What? Asia was already growing then. It's been growing for a long time. It's not a new development. It's the fastest growing region in the world. They have an expanding middle class. They want a more protein intense diet. They want food security and energy security. I think we have perhaps a lot to offer in that regard. And so as a government, we've taken your cue and your counsel and we've worked hard to build the trading partnerships and relationships that we need we have gone on trade missions. We will continue to go on trade missions. We're going to continue to help our exporters take their products to market, especially in that part of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, hear this now. A third of Canadian exports to the ASEAN region, that's Southeast Asian nations, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indo Indonesia, a third of Canadian exports come from you. This is one of the fastest growing regions of the world. This is remarkable, a remarkable economic fact of the country today. 36% of Canadian exports to India. 1.3 billion people and growing at still strong rates today. 36% of Canadian exports to India come from the province of Saskatchewan. And now those exports will include uranium. It was a proud, proud moment in Ottawa. 
It was a proud moment in Ottawa that I got to witness the signing of a deal between the Prime Minister of our country and the Prime Minister of India for seven million pounds of Saskatchewan uranium. The first ever, first in a very long time, shipment of uranium from, uh, from our mines. Credit the federal government here, ladies and gentlemen. Credit the Prime Minister who negotiated nuclear cooperation agreements with India, China before that, that we can move in. Credit Cameco who kicked down that door and were determined and asked us to help. And we met with the appropriate government agencies where, where, when we were in India and then phoned them when we came back. But these seven million pounds of uranium represent significant progress today and more into the future. That country, by the way, has on the books 570 coal plants waiting to get built. There's 400 million Indians without electricity. They want to build more power. Maybe we can do even more for climate change around the world rather than cap and trade in central Canada if we ensure that uranium, CO2 free uranium, is chosen over coal in places like India and China where they're building a coal plant every 13 days. By the way, in China, again with the federal government's help, a nuclear cooperation agreement there and the good work of Cameco, who I think are here tonight, there's sales for over 50 million pounds of Saskatchewan uranium over the next 10 to 15 years. You bet we're going to engage with the world. We're going to go on trade missions. You asked for this. You wanted us to get the message out, I think, whoever the government happened to be. You made this change. Don't let anyone change it back. There's some cowboy hats in the room tonight, and, and we're doing the same thing on cool, uh, on country of origin labeling, which is hurting our cattle industry hurting the pork business, the chicken business, and it looks like the engagement of Canada and the provinces is going to uh, cause the, the, uh, the government there to change their ways and open up trade in this area as well, and, uh, and that's something we should note here as well. Ladies and gentlemen, you have brought so many transformative changes in Saskatchewan. You've demanded them, I think, from our government, and I, and I hope we've tried to respond to them. You've demanded less ideology in health care. We had the longest surgical wait list in the Dominion of Canada not very long ago. We used private clinics in our surgical wait times initiative, added a few more dollars from a growing economy, and now we have the shortest surgical wait list in the Dominion of Canada. I think you were tired of some of the rhetoric that we had, frankly, from social Democrats who like to give speeches about 1960 and the birth of Medicare and wasn't that great and helping the little guy and you, you demanded more than rhetoric, you wanted action. In order for there to be action, we need a strong economy and then you went ahead and built that too. You have made transformational change in Saskatchewan and that should be lauded. But there are some things as I close tonight that I would suggest must never change. They are the core qualities of this place. We're humble, and that should never change. We work hard, that should never change. We're tough, but we're very compassionate. That should never change. We're determined, and we're honest, and we have a good sense of humor, mostly at our own expense, and that should never change. These qualities, never mind what's happening in terms of economic statistics and you know, what's in the Wall Street Journal, never mind who happens to be the government, these values must not change. I just want to close with a couple of examples of people in this province who are demonstrating these examples. I want to tell you about Taylor, Taylor Wodaiko. She's 10 years old. She's sitting right over there watching the big screen. There she is right there on the screen. She's from Lanigan, Saskatchewan. She's with her parents. Uh, Joey's here, Mercy is here. Her youngest brother, Russell, is here. And there are twin brothers, Regan and Tegan, who couldn't be here. They're in Lanigan because they're at Boys and Girls Club. They're getting badges. And frankly, that's way more important than anything that's happening here tonight. The story about Taylor begins at the family dinner table. That shouldn't surprise us. Actually, it was Ronald Reagan that said all the good things in America come from dinner tables, and that's true in our province. We'd probably add quonsets to that. 
in quonsets across the province. There's always a lot of swearing and wrench throwing and amazing inventions that change the world. But this particular transformation happened at a dinner table in Lanigan. One night, I think it was three years ago, Mercia was telling the family about a, a friend she had encountered that day. Mercia's friend had been diagnosed with breast cancer. She was wearing a wig. And Taylor asked a question that I think was beyond her years. She asked where they got the hair to make a wig like that, and Mercia told her that the hair was donated. Well, that planted a seed. And so Taylor declared to her family that she wanted to grow her hair out and she wanted to donate it to make wigs. And she did. And then the next year, Taylor and Mercy were planning her birthday party, and she decided instead of having her guests come and bring uh, gifts, and there would be about 30 of them from her class, so 30 gifts, she would rather have them come and bring donations to the Lanigan and District Food Bank. This year for her birthday, Taylor asked her friends to make a donation to the Addie Francis Fund. Addie's a young woman from Lanigan who was in a terrible car accident in October of 2014. Addie suffered a serious head injury. She's gone through a long period of rehabilitation. She's making great progress. She's back home in Lanigan and Taylor followed her progress on Facebook and she would phone her gran and pa, her grandparents, Mercia's mom and dad, to make sure they knew about what was happening. And on her birthday, Taylor, 10 years old, raised $221.25 for the Addie Francis Fund. So we asked Taylor why she did all of these things, why she would help these people, and she said, and I quote, because it makes me feel good. I wish Taylor could have met my grandpa. They would have found they had a lot in common. Peter Wall was a preacher and an entrepreneur and a farmer and a carpenter. He never got rich, but you know, he, he was successful. He worked hard. He made sure he was there for my dad and Uncle Frank and the brothers as they started their business. They didn't want for the basics, but when they started out, they didn't have much. Grandpa Peter and my grandma Elizabeth were poor, but they were incredibly generous. And just very recently, Uncle Jake, that's the oldest brother, was telling Dad a story about that he could remember about Grandma and Grandpa, that Grandpa had this habit of inviting people over for supper, and maybe not always telling Grandma that this was going to happen. And he remembered one particular occasion when he invited a couple over, and they just had nothing. Grandma had a bit of bread that she baked and some lard to spread on the bread and coffee. But that's what she served. And Uncle Jake said he can remember Grandma maybe feeling a bit embarrassed. Not that they were hosting, but just that she didn't have a lot to offer. But he didn't say that Grandpa seemed embarrassed at all. And that wouldn't surprise me, knowing Grandpa as I do, because he would have honestly thought, well, I, I don't know, I have this. I should at least share what I have. These are the Saskatchewan values that must never change. What has always been best about Saskatchewan, what is best about her still, has nothing to do with politics or who's the premier or who's the government. It's something bigger than that, way bigger than that. What is best about Saskatchewan is her heart. It's her character. This tie that binds, that, this invisible, unbreakable cord that connects Peter Wall to Taylor. That is what is greatest about Saskatchewan. And that's what we need to remember in politics. That's what should inform our politics. So let me end this election year speech with a promise. If you demand from your government that it would have a vision for the economy and a plan for the economy that can create a long-term quality of life that we deserve and if you also demand that that government reflect the heart and the values and the character and the strength of Saskatchewan people, then I think, and here's the promise, one day in the future, you're going to do a bit of reflecting of your own. Maybe you'll even ask a few rhetorical questions, like, remember how it felt when we finally 
turn things around for good. Remember how it, how it felt when Saskatchewan's economy became as strong as her heart. Remember how it felt when we took our place in Canada, when Saskatchewan took her place on the world stage. Remember how it felt when we found our way back home. Thanks for coming. May God bless the province of Saskatchewan. Well, on behalf of everyone here, we would like to thank you, Mr. Premier, for sharing your thoughts with us tonight and for your exemplary leadership. You've helped steer our province in the right direction, and we never want to go back. Very quickly, our Premier has been asked if he would perform for you tonight with Blake Berglund. And he has said that he would consider it if we were able to raise some money for Habitat for Humanity. And so, I leave it to you, if you would like to hear the Premier perform tonight, you come and see us over here at Table 34 and tell us how many thousands of dollars you would like to donate to Habitat for Humanity. Come and see Tammy, and the Premier just might perform for you tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the formal part of our program. Dinner will now be served. Feel free to stay and visit with Premier Wall, his colleagues and guests here once supper is concluded. Enjoy the musical talent of Blake Berglund as he continues to perform for us. And take photos with your MLAs and tweet them out and post them on Instagram with our hashtag. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's event. Once again, thank you for your support. Have a great night and please, Plan a safe ride home. Thank you.